Welcome to the December 2023 LACNITS Educational Event. I'm Kavya Velgapudi, Executive Director of LACNITS. I'm Lisa Yen, Director of Programs and Outreach for LACNITS. And I'm Heather Davis, the Associate Director of Advocacy and Outreach at LACNITS. Today's presentation is on minimally invasive treatments for neuroendocrine liver metastases. A special thank you to our supporters, Ipsen, ITM, Advanced Accelerator Applications, and Chronetics. LACNITS stands for Learn, Advocate, Connect, Neuroendocrine Tumor Society. Our name also states the mission of our patient advocacy organization. Our goal is to empower patients with educational resources and support so they may live richly and fully with NET. The LACNITS staff includes Lisa Yen and Heather Davis. The board includes Donna Gavin, who is the sister of LACNITS founder, Giovanna Joyce Mbezi, and NET patient and patient advocate, Mary Dunleavy, who has been living and thriving with NET for 18 years. We're excited to share that LACNITS is partnering with the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation, or CCF, to provide support line assistance and other programs. For more information, visit lacnets.org slash support line. LACNITS is supported by people like you. Over 90% of our donations are made by NET patients and their loved ones. Your donation funds our greatest needs, such as the production of our educational content, podcasts, support groups, and both virtual and in-person conferences. Please consider making a donation before the end of the year. Thanks to a generous matching donation, your gift will be matched dollar for dollar if received before December 31st. Donate at lacnets.org slash donate. Now over to Heather. Thank you, Kavya. Our YouTube channel features over 300 videos and podcasts. Use our playlist to find webinars on PRRT, liver-directed therapy, clinical trials, imaging, nutrition, FIOPERA, and our annual conferences and patient stories. Follow LACNETS on social media. We are on Facebook, X, and Instagram with the handle at LACNETS. And be sure to add us to your safe sender email list. I'd like to remind our audience that LACNETS webinars are created for educational purposes only and do not substitute for medical advice. The views shared in this webinar are the experts' personal opinions. Please contact your medical team with questions or concerns about your individual care or treatment. And now I'll hand it over to Lisa. Thank you, Heather. As a net caregiver, I, like you, try to stay informed and engaged about the latest in both net treatments and also about clinical trials, because we understand that clinical trials pave the way for future treatments. Understanding various net clinical trials, though, can feel daunting sometimes. So to this end, we launched our clinical trials guide. It's an educational resource that features several key clinical trials for neuroendocrine cancers. You can browse the site by the type of neuroendocrine cancers. You can also browse by some of the types of treatments. And with the individual trial page, you'll find some patient-friendly videos and information about the trials. We hope to help you better understand net clinical trials. It's our pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Yilin Koti. Dr. Koti is an interventional radiologist at TRG Imaging in Portland, Oregon. She was previously the Director of Interventional Oncology and the Assistant Professor at Oregon Health and Science University, or OHSU. Dr. Koti graduated summa cum laude from Tufts University, and she obtained her medical degree from Duke University. Following medical school, she completed an internship at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center and did her residency in diagnostic radiology at the University of California, San Francisco. She then subspecialized in vascular and interventional radiology at the Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute. Dr. Cote is committed to providing individualized evidence-based care for each of her patients, and she serves on several key medical and scientific committees and has numerous publications as well. 
I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Kothi in person last year in June 2022 at Ananas Regional event in Portland and have seen Dr. Kothi speak a couple of times. I've been impressed by her expertise and approach to interventional radiology and interventional oncology and the way she explains these innovative approaches in a very patient-friendly way. As an interventional radiologist oncologist, her expertise is to treat liver tumors, something very important to those of us who are living with or supporting those with neuroendocrine disease. Thank you, Dr. Koti, for joining us to discuss minimally invasive treatments for neuroendocrine liver metastases. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Elon Koti, and I am an interventional radiologist and interventional oncologist at the TRG Medical Imaging in Portland, Oregon. Today, I'm going to be sharing with you how an interventional radiologist, in short IRs, can provide minimally invasive treatments for neuroendocrine liver metastasis. These are my disclosures. Today, I want to introduce you to the field of interventional oncology and discuss some of the therapies we offer patients with neuroendocrine tumors. We will also dive a little deeper into the three main types of treatments we offer patients with neuroendocrine liver metastasis. And these are ablation, chemoembolization, and radioembolization. And I heard a lot of buzz from patient forums who question about the latest ablation technology called histotripsy, so I will cover that as well. So interventional oncology in the recent decade has become the fourth essential pillar of multidisciplinary oncologic care, alongside with medical, surgical, and radiation oncology. We are the physicians who offer minimally invasive procedural treatments under image guidance. And some of the procedures we do include biopsy of the tumors under CT or ultrasound to get a diagnosis, or placement of a chest pore to allow chemotherapy infusions. But a major role we play in oncology is providing a few major treatments that actually kills and controls neuroendocrine tumors in the liver. Neuroendocrine tumors often present with liver metastasis. In fact, approximately 50% of patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and 75% with small bowel neuroendocrine tumors will be presenting with liver metastasis or will subsequently develop liver metastasis. And patients often present with significant tumor burden as the disease is often indolent. Unfortunately, less than a quarter of patients will present with cancer that will allow complete resection. However, studies do show that if we are able to debulk and reduce the burden of disease in the liver by 70%, we can significantly improve overall survival and progression-free survival in patients with carcinoid, pancreatic, and small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. In addition, this reduction in tumor, also called cytoreduction, reduction, can improve hormonal symptoms related to the cancer. So surgery is a first-line therapy for cytoreduction. reduction. However, many patients are actually not great candidates for surgery for a variety of different reasons. And so today, I will focus on three major cytoreductive treatment options for metastasis in the liver for patients who are typically not good surgical candidates. And the first one is ablation. Ablations are a category of treatment techniques that cause tumor destructions by either burning the tumors causing coagulative necrosis, freezing the tumor, or using electricity to cause apoptosis of the cells. And ablations are typically done laparoscopically or percutaneously as we in interventional radiology do. And the goal of treatment is to treat the tumors individually. Typically, up to five tumors can be treated safely in a single session. And the goal of ablation is for cytoreduction reduction or symptom control by killing the tumor while preserving as much normal liver as possible. And in certain scenarios, it can be curative, and it is best reserved for patients with limited number of tumors and whose tumors are less than three to five centimeters in size. Just this year, a new technique called histotripsy just came on the market and was just approved by the FDA, and I will talk about that shortly as well. In most centers at this time, all ablations except for histotripsy is performed by making a tiny incision on the skin 
overlying where we want to replace the needle. Through the tiny incision, we place one, two, or three probes into the liver tumors under imaging, usually under CAT scan or ultrasound to make sure we can achieve the treatment zone we want. Here you can see, for example, an MRI uh, with a tumor in the right lobe of the liver. And the arrows show the two microwave probes I place in the tumor. And during the procedure, I can see the treatment zone to make sure I have killed the entirety of the tumor. This type of treatment minimizes the amount of collateral damage to the normal liver. It can be done in one to three hours and can be typically done with either moderate sedation or general anesthesia. The recovery is really quick and most patients don't feel any pain or symptoms after treatment. In terms of efficacy, it is often reported in conjunction with surgical resection. A meta-analysis has shown that in select patients, radiofrequency ablations can lead to partial or complete symptomatic relief in 90% of the patients with a mean duration of symptomatic relief of 14 to 27 months. However, there is a relatively high rate of local recurrence with radiofrequency ablation of 10 to 25%. In addition, as expected with metastatic disease, additional liver metastasis growing elsewhere in the liver is common regardless of the ablation technique. However, you can always go back and retreat as needed. Microwave is like radiofrequency ablation and uses heat to burn the tumors. It creates a larger ablation zone and has replaced radiofrequency ablation in most centers because it's more effective. Cryoablation is a method that freezes a tumor. However, it isn't used in the liver because of high bleeding risks. Irreversible electroporation, also known as nano knife, is a technique that uses electricity to cause apoptosis in the tumor cells. And is typically reserved for treating tumors where microwave or RFA cannot be safely used. And the benefit is that unlike other techniques, it preserves the blood vessels in, in important collagen structures near it. Unfortunately, because it uses electricity, certain patients with cardiac arrhythmias are not great candidates for this technique. The latest ablation technique that has been invented is histotripsy. This technique uses the unique properties of sound waves to kill tumor. It forms high energy microbubbles that causes the tumors to break apart this technique is incredible because it's the first non-invasive technique where no incisions has to be made. However, it is important to note that there are limitations, including needing a specific type of general anesthesia not available everywhere, and the tumor should be available and visible on ultrasound. To summarize at this time, ablation is best for patients with limited liver disease. There are many different ablation techniques that are available. The technique with the most research behind it for neuroendocrine tumor is heat-based techniques such as radiofrequency ablation and microwave. IRE and histotripsy are newer techniques available only in select centers. Histotripsy shows incredible promise but still has not had a chance to produce any data in neuroendocrine tumor. And if you are a patient looking to see if you're a candidate for any of these procedures, you can get a second opinion as size with it or directly reach out to angiodynamics or histosonics regarding where these techniques are available. The next treatment I want to talk about is transarterial embolization. This technique is often used in patients with many, many tumors and are not good surgical resection or ablation candidates. An embolization is a delivery of embolic, which can be particles, lipidal, or beads into the arteries in the liver supplying the tumor with the purpose of occluding the blood vessel. TAE with the transarterial embolization is also known as blend embolization. This procedure only uses particle without chemotherapy, whereas TAS stands for transarterial chemoembolization delivers chemotherapy to tumors in addition to something that occludes the blood vessel. There are also two types of chemoembolization. Initially, we have used particles with drugs attached to it called drug-eluting beads. However, it is no longer used for neuroendocrine tumors because multiple studies have shown that there is up to 10% complication rates when it is used. 
So when we refer to taste now is when we mix a water-soluble chemotherapy with lipidol, which is an oil, to create an emulsion, which is then used to embolize the tumor. And in the picture below, this is to typically what the mixture looks like. The rationale behind taste and blend embolization is that while tumors derive its blood supply from the hepatic arteries, the normal liver parenchyma derives most of its blood supply from the portal veins. Therefore, treatment in the hepatic arteries can more selectively treat the tumors over the underlying background liver. And neuroendocrine liver metastases are great candidates for intraarterial embolization therapies because they are often hypervascular, which means they're supplied by the hepatic arteries. Even if hypervascularity is subtle on CT, it is often very hypervascular on angiogram as you see it here. So how is it done? Well, in the most simplified way that I explain to my patients is that we make a pinhole axis through the radial or femoral artery. We use really thin catheters to select hepatic arteries supplying the tumors. The treatments are often lobar, as in half of the liver at the time. This is because patients who get TASE or TAE tend to have a lot of disease. The procedure is done under live x-rays and we can see the tumors by the way it takes up the contrast in the blood. The contrast here is dark. So in the middle image, you can see all these round tumors taking up contrast. And on the right, you can see beads of chemotherapy oils that are being delivered to the vessels during the procedure. There isn't any consensus on the type or size of particle use, and it depends a little bit on local availability. Typically, 100 to 500 micron beads are used. There's also no consensus on the type of chemotherapy agent to use for TASE because there isn't any prospective data on that. Most commonly, doxorubicin is used for historical reasons because that is a drug used for hepatocellular carcinomas. And more recently, oxaliplatin has been used for patients with carcinoid heart disease because doxorubicin has cardiotoxicity if given systemically. The NCCN guidelines recommend blend or chemoembolization for well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor that is liver dominant or unresectable if the patient is symptomatic despite being on therapy or having progressive disease or have significant bulky liver disease and cannot undergo surgery. Studies have shown that both TASE and blend embolization has about 85% symptom control rate and approximately 60% objective response rate, and this has comes with good survival outcomes. It does have side effects and complications like every procedure do. It is commonly associated with post-embolization syndrome, which presents with nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. And this is seen in up to 40 to 70% of the patients, but lasts less than a week and is self-limited and managed conservatively in pain medications. It is also associated with interruptive carcinoid crisis in up to 20% of the cases, but that can also be seen with ablation and surgery. However, the overall risk of damage to the liver is very low, which makes this procedure overall very safe. One of the benefits of taste and blend embolization is that they can be used repeatedly. So how well does it work? A recent single-centered retrospective study recently addressed this question by looking at 200 plus patients over a span of 15 years. And they followed these patients after the procedures and gave the patients multiple cycles of treatments. They found that with more cycles of taste, liver progression does start occurring faster, which is expected. And the overall mean time to tumor progression is 26 months, which is still really long and supports taste for global control. In addition, they saw that the response rate is sustained over multiple cycles of treatment, with patients living on average seven to eight years if they responded to treatment. In addition, they had a more than reasonable safety profile with less than 3% adverse events, not including post-embolization syndrome. And these adverse events included liver abscess, bilomas, carcinoid crisis, and cholecystitis, which are often temporary and manageable, and no direct or permanent liver toxicity was seen. So what does this mean? Because it can be given multiple times safely with good outcomes, 
Perhaps we should consider it more in line with repetitive chemotherapy treatments given at regular intervals rather than just salvage therapy when disease or symptom control are out of hand or after it has failed too many therapies. In addition, this can be used even in patients with cancers outside of the liver because the overall survival benefit is not related to that. In terms of comparisons, we don't see much difference between chemoembolization and bland embolization in terms of when the tumors come back, survival, and symptom control. The RETNET trial is really the trial that we're all waiting for. It is a prospective trial of taste versus bland embolization. It closed a short while ago, so hopefully we will get some results soon. In terms of how they compare to systemic therapy, we don't have much direct comparative data except for a paper published in 2020. However, it is based on data now that is over 10 years old, but it showed that liver-directed therapies including TASE and TAE in the California Cancer Registry had better overall and disease-specific survival by over 20 months compared to systemic therapy alone. I want to show you two case examples to show you a little bit of what we do. This is a 54-year-old with small bowel neuroendocrine tumor to the liver, and she had liver depoking surgery and resection of her primary tumor three years ago. However, her liver disease has been growing and now encompasses 60 to 70% of the liver. And we don't want the disease to grow any further because the patient can potentially die from liver failure. And in addition, she has significant symptoms as well. This is her CAT scan before we did the procedure for her. And this is her liver. And you see all the bright spots inside? These are the tumors. And here is me highlighting some of the big ones. I treated her whole liver over three separate sections with blend embolizations spaced one month apart. And during the procedure, you can see how these tumors took up all the contrast. And after embolization, you get rid of the blood flow to the tumors with the particles. So again, this is a picture what it looks like before. And I want to show you what it looks like now afterwards. As you can see, there are far fewer bright spots in the liver. The ones you see here are mostly vessels. The spots that we do see are so small that I can hardly see them. In addition to that, in the area where there was a large tumor, you can see that there's internal necrosis, which shows up dark because it, it doesn't take up any more contrast since the tumor died. The patient did really well and had no symptoms afterwards. And the second case I want to show you is a patient with really bad hypoglycemia due to metastatic insulinoma. Her disease could not be debulked intraoperatively, and she requires significant glucose infusions, up to 100 milliliters per hour of D25. And D25 stands for 25% dextrose infusion. On imaging, she had large tumors in both sides of her liver. I treated her while she was in the hospital because she could not leave and was dependent on the infusions. And I treated her right liver first because it was a site with the largest burden of tumors and she had excellent response. Before treatment, she was barely maintained with a sugar level of 60 to 100 despite being on the high infusion rate. On the day of treatment and the day after, she had immediate response, but we continue to see some drops in the sugar levels because in the days after, as a tumor dies, it can release more hormones, and that can be sometimes the most dangerous period of time for the patient. But once she passed a critical period, she was able to be titrated off the infusion, and ultimately, she was able to go home without any infusions. And lastly, briefly about taste in the era of PRT. We know that as long as liver-directed therapy is carefully given, it does not cause permanent abnormal liver function and does not preclude PRT in the future. This is especially great because there's also a new PRRT using a different radiation called alpha radiation, and that is starting to show great promise as well. So to quickly summarize what we talked so far about taste and bland embolization, it is used for patients with symptomatic, progressive, or bulky liver disease. And we think that taste and bland embolization right now are essentially interchangeable, and we'll eagerly await the data from the RETNET trial to see if there is a difference. And we know that taste can be safely used and repeated with sustained response, 
and it can be used either before or after PRT. Now I want to talk about Y90 radio embolization. Radio embolization is also known commonly as tear Y90 or selective internal beam radiation. And it's a technique that uses radioactive beads to deliver radiation specific to the liver. The radiation used is yttrium-90, which is a beta emitter with an average penetration depth of only 2.4 millimeter and a half-life of less than three days. The dose delivery is done intra-arterially and stays within the liver only. It is important to differentiate from taste in that it doesn't include the treatment blood vessel and the tumor death does not occur through ischemia but from the radioactivity. As of the latest guideline, we know that relative to other types of metastatic liver disease, patients with neuroendocrine tumors live longer. As such, we understand that there is increasing evidence that radioembolization can cause long-term toxicity to the liver when the entire liver is treated, especially in a single session. As such, we are moving away from whole liver treatment in the single session and focus more on low bar treatments and occasionally even in smaller segmental territories. It is also indicated in patients with prior Whipple or biliary tract instrumentation because that is associated with a much lower risk of liver abscess formation and biliary complication than taste or TAE. It is also better tolerated in terms of side effects and pain than taste or TAE. So it is considered in patients who are sometimes perhaps too sick to undergo blend or chemo embolization. So quickly about how it is done. It is similar to chemo embolization in that we go into the arteries of the liver. However, it is a little bit more complex in that it needs two different procedures and a few more steps. The first procedure's goal is to map out the vessel supplying the tumor. Everyone's vessel anatomy in the liver is very different, so it takes careful investigation. If there are branches going to the stomach or the bowel, those are embolized with coils to protect the radioactive particles from going into these tissues. And then we deliver technetium-bound albumin, which is something we use to mimic Y90 delivery to determine whether Y90 can be safely given. If a large lung shunt fraction is seen, then we cannot do the procedure. However, if the lung shunt fraction is reasonable, we will order a custom dose of radiation for the patient, and then this treatment dose is given on a different day. If a second section is needed, that is typically performed four to six weeks later. In terms of short-term efficacy, Dr. Broad showed a disease control rate of 91% and a three-month objective response rate of 26%. In addition, they show symptom control or resolution was achieved in close to 80% of the patients. And more recently, other retrospective studies found similar disease control rates. In terms of long-term survival, Y90 is associated with increased survival of 31 to 41, as well as increased global and hepatic progression-free survivals. In terms of short-term toxicity-wise, it carries approximately a 33% grade 3 plus toxicity, and that includes 7 to 8% liver abscess. But that is almost entirely seen in patients with biliary colonization, and still much less if taste was performed. If taste or blend embolization was performed for those with biliary colonizations, you can have up to 20% rate of liver abscess and about 7% will still have persistent abnormal LFTs. In general, patients tend to have less symptoms such as post amplification syndromes and feel much better in the immediate setting compared to taste because they have less pain. But with tear, we worry more about long-term liver decompensation. Multiple studies published in the past really showed a rate of one to 7% tear-related clinically significant liver decompensation, and that is almost entirely limited to whole liver treatment. There aren't many studies that compare radio embolization to taste or TAE. One retrospective study in 2019 showed that disease control rate was greater with taste and tear, but there's no difference in survival. The study is limited because patients who got tear tend to be patients who have more advanced disease. So what about toxicity? 
They also didn't see any significant difference, but we now know that there is radioembolization induced chronic hepatotoxicity that we talked about, especially if patients have more than 50% of the liver treated or has pre-existing cirrhosis. And this is compared to approximately 3% hepatotoxicity that we otherwise see with just bland embolization. There's also significant debate regarding the combination of Y90 and PRT since both are radiation treatments. However, NETA-1 showed that there is no significant hepatotoxicity with PRT alone. And in looking at combination treatments of PRT and Y90, all of the toxicity rates are about 7 to 8%. So the long-term toxicity rate with a combination is not really any different than that of TER alone. So there's really no evidence for or against the safety or sequencing of TER or, or PRT. And we do not know what the safety of this combination therapy will be as we move away from beta PRT to alpha PRT. Alpha PRT has some significant and amazing cytotoxicities, but given it has a much shorter tissue range, I suspect that it will also be safe to use in combination with Y90 as well. So to summarize, uh, we interventional radiologists and oncologists offer many cancer-related treatments. Ablation, chemoembolization, blend embolization, and radioembolization are some of the treatment options available to patients with metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. And they can be potentially used in conjunctions with other therapeutics, including PRRT. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to answering any questions. Dr. Koti, thank you so much for that very helpful and um, informative presentation. Um, we're really excited to have this opportunity to ask you questions, and we have about 40 questions already that circled wow. in. <laughs> so just as a well, reminder thank you for, for our audience, me. yes, we're really, really excited to have you, um, and thank you for making the time during this busy holiday season. Just a reminder for our audience, this question and answer session is for educational purposes only. It does not substitute for medical advice. And please do talk to your medical team with any individual or specific questions or concerns about your individual care or treatment. Again, we have uh, many questions and yes, we do have a long time to go over them, um, but it's not possible to go over all of them. So we'll try to get to as many general questions as possible. Some of them we've um, combined or reworded it to uh, best serve as many people as possible. So um, Dr. Koti, um, let's start with this um, general question about um, imaging in general. What size must lesions in the liver be to be visible by ultrasound? Or in, what about other imaging scans? Well, actually, you know, the ultrasound is very sensitive in picking up tumors in the liver. Um, it does depend a little bit on the echogenicity of the liver uh, background. So what we mean by that is on the ultrasound, how bright it looks, um, because uh, you need to be able to see the tumor only when you can see the difference against the background tumor. Um, there's no definite size cutoff. Um, you can find things as little as, you know, three, four millimeters. Um, but often, as long as it's more than a centimeter, it definitely can be picked up. CAT scans is also very sensitive. Um, MRI is potentially even more sensitive uh, than the CAT scan. Uh, the size, uh, where size does play a role is in PET scans, uh, because PET may not pick up lesions smaller than 7 to 10 millimeters. Okay, that's helpful. So, um, so I guess... It, People might wonder, are there spots that are too small to be picked up on the ultrasound or any imaging? Well, um, there are spots that are always too small to be picked up. Uh, like I said, MRI is probably the most sensitive in picking up tiny spots, um, as long as it's a good quality MRI that doesn't have motion artifact. And um, in an ultrasound, it depends a little bit on the sonographer that performed the study. So when we're looking at a study, we're looking at the images provided by our fantastic sonographers. Um, so if you know it's the lesion is being shadowed by the ribs, like we can't see it behind the ribs, then we may miss it. Okay, thanks. Um, mm -hmm. So let's move to this topic of ablation. I, I, you did a really fantastic job covering so many different types of treatments. So um, the first one you covered was on this whole topic of ablation. So um, I'm wondering, how do you decide if someone is a candidate for liver ablation versus bland embolization, and how many liver spots are too many for ablation? I know you touched on this a little bit. 
Yeah. Um, so for the main deciding factor is the number and size of tumors in the liver. So um, according to the current guidelines, you want to treat tumors less than three centimeters. In some places, they treat up to five centimeters, but less than five in number. Um, this is because every time we do treat a tumor, we not only have to uh, go after the tumor itself, we have to take a portion of the liver around it. Um, blend embolization, on the other hand, uh, we'll be able to cover tumors that are even too small to be seen. So it really covers a territory of liver. Um, so there's no limitations except by percentage of tumors in the liver uh, for uh, qualification for embolization. When the liver has more than 70% uh, tumor, then it becomes potentially too risky to undergo embolization. Okay. So you, you had you had a nice picture of um, the necrotic tissue. So after the tumors are bladed or treated with other liver directed methods, what happens to that dead t tumor tissue? Does it stay there as necrotic tissue? Is it absorbed by the body or fleshed out? What happens? No, that's a really good question. I actually get this question quite often. Um, so our body has fantastic ways of getting rid of necrotic tissues, but it does take time. So initially it just kind of becomes like a necrotic garbage can basically, right? Um, but over time your body will kind of resorb it. And so a couple of years later, you can even completely disappear from, um, from your liver itself. And all you are left with is like a little scar or cavity. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's helpful to know. And you know, I know that with my husband's after his um, radio frequency ablations, it looked like that that you showed on the scan. Does it continue to look like that for quite some time? It will look like um, basically a black hole oftentimes. So um, in areas where there has been done ablations, uh, when you give contrast, the liver cells will no longer take up the contrast. So it be looks like a black hole with a contrast enhanced imaging. Uh, typically, gas will resolve by itself over a couple of weeks. Um, if we still see gas later on, um, it raises suspicion for infection because typically we don't see gas um, you know, in the follow-up scans. Thank you for that. Um, and I appreciated those images too. That was very helpful to mm -hmm. see. Um, does ablation carry a higher risk of abscess than embolizations if someone had a Whipple procedure? And if so, can you explain that? Yeah, that is a really good question. Um, so the Whipple procedure um, interrupts what we call it a normal biliary sphincter because you have to kind of get rid of that portion. And so any procedure that interrupts the normal biliary sphincter, including an ERCP, allows bacteria to potentially to have gone into the bowel duct itself. And because there is no valve that prevents a bacteria going to the biliary duct, where in the liver itself, the biliary duct can be colonized with bacteria. And so when we do an ablation or even blend embolization and create necrotic tissue environment, bacteria like to grow growing it. So with blend embolization, you can have up to 20% chance of abscess formation. Uh, you can reduce those risks with prolonged antibiotics, but still the risk of that is much higher than if you underwent radio embolization. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Um, so let's tackle the topic of histotripsy. I know that's um, caused a lot of interest since it's new, and there's a lot of um, questions around this. So one of the most popular ones today is, can histotripsy be used for tumors outside the liver, such as the pancreas or the lung? Yeah, um, histotripsy is such a brand new um, technology, which is absolutely fantastic. It got approved for the liver because that was the easiest and the, the best thing to go after. However, I know the company is working on getting histotripsy approved and having data collected for other type of tumors. The major limitation is whether um, this tumor can be seen under ultrasound because the histotripsy does depend on ultrasound at this time. Um, there are more advanced technologies in certain select centers that can use fusion imaging. Um, I don't think that is kind of the standard yet. So places, for example, that's very easy seen on ultrasound include the kidney, the lung is a little bit more difficult without fusion technology because the lung has a lot of air and air creates a barrier and a blackness that does not allow our ultrasound to penetrate to the level of the tumor. Okay, thank you. So stay tuned. Um, 
for more. Yeah, stay tuned. And, <laughs> um, so you mentioned the study, and if you could, uh, I don't know if you you happen to know how many human subjects have been treated with the histotripsy since the FDA approval, and what the safety record has been like, or even during the um, trial. Oh, I actually do not remember how many human subjects have been treated since approval because it just recently got approved a few months ago. And uh, I, I don't think we'd know the safety records since approval as well. However, there are um, centers with histotripsy and there's more and more centers that are getting histotripsy. And as we have more patients undergo histotripsy, we will, will know kind of the safety and efficacy profile um, furthermore as we collect more data. Thank you. So one of the most common questions today and in all the educational programs I've, I've been listening to in the last month is really where or how can you find out if your center or centers near you have it? And I know you mentioned it, you touched on it a little bit, but how can patients go about finding out this information? Yeah, so um, I would say ablations pretty much offer in most centers. Um, some type of heat based ablation is almost always offered in most centers. If they don't offer it, you know, try to go to another center. Uh, embolization as well and Y90 are pretty much offered everywhere. Uh, specific ablation techniques such as nano knife. Um, so the nano knife itself, um, they have a website with a physician locator um, that you can find physicians that can use that technology. I don't believe histotripsy has yet um, that physician locator technology, but as I showed in the slides earlier, these are the sites I currently know have um, a histotripsy machine or planning to get one uh, in the near future. And I think as time goes on, you know, more and more center will be getting it. So it, it's you can you know reach out directly to the histosonics uh, company if you're interested as a patient to see if there's a center nearby that offers this technology. Okay, and another practical question is, is it covered by insurance or how would patients again find out about that? Yeah, insurance is a very challenging question. Um, you know, we run into this all the time. So uh, histotripsy is FDA approved um, to my knowledge, um, but um, whether insurance can cover it, covers it or not, it, can always, it really depends by the insurance. But not to fret, you know, oftentimes um, when we, you book a procedure for histotripsy, we will run your insurance, um, as, at least in the most center, and to see if you can get a pre-approval for the procedure. Um, the pre-approval for the procedure does not guarantee payment. However, it gives you kind of a, you know, at least a reassurance, hopefully something will, will be covered. Um, well, if it does not get approved, then um, physicians will often do a peer-to-peer -peer review with the insurance company to fight on your behalf to get it approved. So this is usually how the process goes. Thank you. Thank you for outlining that process. That helps. Um, how, have there been any reports about the side effects of histotripsy and what the recovery process was like? Yeah, since I personally do not treat histotripsy, I cannot tell you too much about much of the side effects. Um, but from my understanding, there is always a little bit of recovery period, but not too much different than a microwave ablation. And you don't have a needle or anything that, or skin incision that it takes uh, for you to recover. Um, I think probably the worst part initially is going to be the, the anesthesia itself. Uh, but I will encourage you to reach out to the physicians who do histosonics and to really ask these questions in detail. Well, you mentioned anesthesia, and this one question came up about the anesthesia you mentioned um, during your presentation. Why does histotripsy require such a specific general anesthesia, and how does it differ from other methods of general anesthesia? Yeah, so histotripsy is ideally performed with a form of anesthesia called jet ventilation. And jet ventilation uses kind of a tube to help you breathe, but it's a continuous process so that your lung does not move. And therefore, um, because your lung is not moving, your diaphragm is not moving, and then your liver is not moving. So it's a target is not moving during this entire case. So it makes a very safe um, and predictable procedure. However, Histotripsy in most centers actually now has just been done with regular anesthesia. It turns out the water bath sitting on top of the patient is kind of immobilizes the liver in most part. So for most purposes, uh, most places are just using regular anesthesia. Okay, thank you. Um, people are curious in histotripsy, how are the cells identified and localized for destruction by ultrasound? 
Yeah, you can uh, visualize uh, this, the tumor um, outline uh, by the way it looks different from the background liver, and then the operator will select um, at the target. Okay, thank you. And how does this procedure, histotripsy, differ from Y90? Yeah, so histotripsy is completely non-invasive, um, but does require anesthesia. Y90 is an office-based procedure in some ways, but it is a procedure, so an incision has to be made, and you have to lie on the operating table um, and to undergo this procedure. Histotripsy does not use any radiation. It uses ultrasound waves to help kill the cells. Y90 uses radiation to target uh, the tumors. Um, in addition to that, histotripsy is targeting specific tumors one at a time, whereas Y90 is to typically treat um, multifocal disease in a territory uh, in the liver. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. How do you know if a bland embolization has been effective? What do you do to assess that? Yeah, um, so after patient undergoes bland embolization, we typically bring them back a month and three months later and six months later. Uh, I personally like to do imaging every three to six months um, just to see how effective it has been. Tumors previously, um, you know, you'll see on a CAT scan, they tend to light up on a CAT scan. It's really, really bright. You can, it's shown on my prior images. But after embolization, you can see the tumor gets necrotic. So the area that was bright will become dark. Or you can see tumors even shrink in size. And so that's typically what we are looking for. Thank you. And how long can you expect to have the benefits after blind embolization? of liver tumors? Yeah, um, this is a very variable um, from patient to patient in my experience. Uh, some patients, you know, have a lasting uh, benefits from the bland embolizations, um, especially those with really low grade tumors um, and very slow growing tumors. So once they shrink, they don't really kind of grow as fast. Whereas some tumors with um, kind of more aggressive and fast growing tumors, they can grow back really fast. Um, and at this point, you know, repeating embolization may not be the best choice for those patients because the risk may outweigh the benefit. Yeah, okay. Um, it really varies you. patient by patient. <laughs> yeah, and how often can you repeat that then? The blind embolization. Yeah, studies have shown um, that it, uh, you know you can actually safely repeat it. You know, three to four cycles, and cycles means you know the entire liver. So one cycle may take two to three sessions. You know, you don't want to treat the entire liver in one, so you treat like left and then right, or left part of right and then part of right. And, and it shows that every time the tumors can kind of continue to shrink. Of course, it's each time it becomes slightly less effective, but it's still very effective. It's like for, like 40 to 60% response rate. Um, so, so it is still an effective strategy and can be repeated safely. And when you repeat it, um, what is the time frame you might wait to, to repeat it? Is, is there a minimum or yeah. maximum? This is a very uh, institutional uh, based answer. I mean, uh, every physician will operate a little differently uh, and is a little subjective and depends on specific patient factors, like how well did they tolerate the embolization last time? You know, did they have a lot of side effects or was it like a piece of cake for them? Um, so usually, you know, if the patient has tumors that came back within three or six months, you know, I'm saying, hey, maybe it's not worthwhile trying to go after for another cycle. But now if the patient had like, you know, a whole year or two of response, then I think it would be worthwhile. Uh, but as that is my personal kind of treatment decision tree, um, there's like real no true consensus uh, with that. Okay. And then when you do it in one cycle, like left and then right, how long do you wait in between those? Yeah, the typical is uh, three to four weeks. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, we want and, to give the liver a little time to recover. Okay. And um, so three to four weeks, um, is there a point to waiting longer than that to recover longer? Or is there a reason mm -hmm. for the three to four weeks? We would like to keep it like in a single cycle as closely together. However, it is again, like a very personalized care. So it just, just depends on um, how the patient responded, you know, if the patient had a really rough time with the first cycle and, you know, it is okay for us to wait a little bit before we treat the other side, then I think waiting extra time is totally reasonable. Thank you. There's 
many questions about how you make decisions. So I'm wondering, <laughs> how does the grade of the tumor affect the choice of minimally invasive procedures, like low grade um, might be favored or not utilized for some? Yeah, overall, most of the liver directed therapies that we talked about are for low grade tumors that are, are slow growing. Um, with high grade, you know, grade three plus that is poorly differentiated, these tumors unfortunately tend to grow faster than, um, you know, the benefit that we can bring about by providing a localized treatment such as ablation or even a bland embolization and Y90. So this is kind of the, the decision tree and kind of the recommendation typically from the N NCCN as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, if someone has significant small tumors throughout the liver and then maybe many microscopic tumors to small to image, how does this impact treatment choice? Yeah, if the patient has many small tumors throughout the liver, more than five and oftentimes too many to count or to see, um, Ablation is definitely out of the question. And ablation, including radiofrequency and microwave and histotripsy, because um, you can, you know, target 100 tumors and you're going to miss some and there's new ones that may be growing. Um, in those cases, we do do kind of a low bar approach, uh, whether it's through embolization or Y90 or, or even PRT, that is also a treatment option. Okay. What are the reasons to do PRT versus liver-directed therapy in the context of liver-dominant disease? Oh, that is a controversial topic. <laughs> um, so, you know, we had great hopes for PRT, um, but the NETA-1 trial showed some limitations of PRT because it did not actually significantly uh, change survival benefits. Um, specifically, it showed that PRT works less well for tumors larger than two centimeters. Um, liver directed therapy is actually very good at shrinking tumors, whereas PRT kind of is really good at stabilizing tumors. And so, you know, it's kind of, if we are, if we're trying to really shrink the tumors, you typically go after with the liver directed therapies. If you kind of just like make sure the tumor doesn't grow any bigger, PRT is often a good option. In addition to that, liver directed therapy only targets liver. It does not address any other tumors elsewhere. Whereas PRT is great for targeting tumors throughout the body, especially in the setting of bony metastasis. And, you know, PRT can help stabilize those tumors and um, is, is very beneficial in those scenarios. Yeah, m many different options to choose from. It, it gets um, especially confusing or difficult now that there are more, more treatment options. There are so many good options and, you know, PRT is coming out kind of this new PRT as well. And I think that I have a lot of hope in that technology as well. And, you know, perhaps we're going to come to a day where liver directed therapy is no longer needed and all you have to do is take a pill or something. So that would be absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Well, speaking of um, new PRT and, and, and this topic, uh, what about PRT treatments directly infused into the liver? Um, so PRT treatments directly infused into the liver are done only in select centers. Um, it's uh, typically done in the setting of clinical trials, and we actually don't know if there's any difference um, versus kind of intravenous PRT infusion. I think there's a currently a study that's ongoing looking at that difference, but uh, we do not know the answer to that. Um, so it kind of, I would kind of recommend you to talk to uh, your local oncologist um, and your interventional radiologist, and as well as the nuclear medicine radiologist who administers the PRT medications. Yeah, there's many unanswered questions still, and uh, more more to come hopefully. Yeah. Um, how does taste and taste? impact PRT efficacy in terms of possibly disrupting the tumor blood vessels and perhaps shunting treated areas off um, from PRT delivery? Yeah, uh, well, I guess if it's a PRT delivery intraarterially, maybe it, it, it's going to have more of an impact. But uh, we do not actually know how TACE and TAE will impact the PRT efficacy in terms of how it disrupts the blood vessel. But because PRT will be systemic and through the venous system, um, you know, it, it hasn't been theorized that it's going to really 
significantly impact it, but it has not been studied. Um, there are theories that since PRT doesn't really work as well for tumors that are large, potentially shrinking the tumor with some form of embolization can improve the efficacy of PRT, but that is theoretical um, and yet un un unproven. Okay, thank you. Um, so are any of these treatments available or applicable to someone who's currently undergoing PRT or should they be done after the full set of the four treatments of PRT are completed? Well, that that is a very uh, individualized question. Um, some people don't tolerate doing all four cycles of PRT. You know, in those scenarios, then you have to hold PRT and consider different strategies. Frequently, um, I know, I think most physicians would like PRT to be completed before initiating something else. However, in select centers, um, I'm sure that they may consider doing this simultaneously, but this will typically be done in a setting of clinical trial. So. Um, you know, it's very institutional based. Again, I encourage you to ask your local um, doctor there. Thank you. Um, so how does SUV values inform treatment, if at all? Yeah, yeah. Um, so SUV value um, in, you know, Dota Tate tells us how confident we are that this is tumor and, you know, potentially how aggressive it is. Um, if it's Dota Tate positive, then, you know, it suggests that it may be amenable for, you know, hormonal uh, somatostatin-based treatments, um, such as PRT. However, um, in terms of liver-directed therapies-wise, it does not um, make too much of a difference. Now, if there's a lesion um, that is, for example, um, like all the other lesions were not um, bright, and then one lesion is bright or one lesion is different and growing, then, you know, it may prompt us to take a sample from this new lesion to figure out what is going on that is different. Okay, thank you. And what contributes to your decision to go with one kind of embolization over another? Do you go in a specific order like LAN, chemo, radio, embolization? Yeah, um, a lot of things going to our decision. So um, some things in terms of, you know, what type of treatment has the patient had? Or what type of surgery has the patient had? You know, going back to the abscess risk, did the patient have any ERCPs or Whipple's procedure? Uh, because if they did, then that preferentially offer radioembolization. Other things then go into my decision making, including is like, how healthy is this patient? You know, can they tolerate, you know, a couple cycles of embolization and can they, or, uh, you know, they're kind of more on the frail side. Um, in general, I do, I am more worried about the long-term side effects of radio embolization um, in terms of the, the risk of cirrhosis and injury to the background liver. Um, so if the patient is otherwise super healthy, has no contraindications, um, I do start with either blend or chemo embolizations. And if the patient, you know, has, uh, are a little bit more frail, um, I tend to go with radio embolization because just it's, way, it's less side effects. Uh, okay. in the immediate setting. Yeah, that helps. That helps to know how you how you think about it. And is there a limited number of liver-directed treatments, especially with bland or chemoembolization that a patient can have? Um, yeah, it kind of goes back to the chemoembolization that we talked about. So well, for radioembolization, you really just do it once unless it's going to be a very selective treatment that happened once and you're treating somewhere else the second time. But for the bland and chemoembolization, you can uh, repeat it uh, as long as your liver function tolerates. Um, studies have shown that it can be safely done uh, at least three times. Okay, thanks. Um, I know you've touched on this, uh, especially with the previous question, but what factors seem to contribute to the success of various forms of embolization for a given patient? How do you know if it's going to work better? Oh, I, the, I think the answer is that we don't know. <laughs> Um, we, we don't know, and this is a thing that's uh, actively being studied. You know, we don't know, for example, whether chemoembolization is as if, is effective, as just as effective, or more effective, or less effective than blind embolization. And we're waiting for the results from the retina trials for that. Uh, we know that Debtase um, is toxic to the patient, and therefore the trial kind of ended that arm. So that is no longer favored to be used. Um, but in terms of direct comparisons between TASE or radioembolization, like there, there hasn't been any um, prospective randomized controlled trials to really, you know, 
be able to compare any methods of treatments. Yeah, so more more studies, clinical trials, not just on new treatments, but also interventional radiology or liver diagnosis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, what current treatment does the least amount of damage to liver's function, if we know? Uh, it just depends how much tumor there is. Um, in general, if there's very little tumor, we do want to go with ablation because studies have shown for small tumors, less than three centimeters, it can be as effective as surgical resection. Um, and you kind of limit the damage just to for the one or two areas you treat. Um, now, if the tumor is elsewhere, then you know it's targeting it everywhere with ablation, maybe too much collateral damage. And um, at which point I would consider a different strategy such as PRT or ablation or, I mean, if, or embolization, et cetera. Thank you. Um, and this is an interesting question. It may be a little specific, but how do you assess the risks of liver embolizations and ablation for someone with a biliary stent and where might histotripsy fit into your thinking? Yeah, so biliary, so when patients have a biliary stent, uh, it means like the biliary tree has been um, entered and typically when they enter it, they go from the small bowel. And so there, there is a colonization of bacteria frequently in those patients. So in those patients, um, the blood embolization, chemoembolization, and ablation comes with a higher risk of liver abscess formation. Histotripsy falls in the category of ablation. And the bacteria does not come from, you know, the probes of the ablation or the catheters. The bacteria really just already lives in the biliary tree, which is what makes the risk of uh, liver abscess high. Wow. Okay. That's something to keep in mind. Thank you for explaining that. Um, and I know we, we did talk um, about this a little bit earlier, but there were several questions about heavy tumor burden. So if someone has more than 50 uh, liver metastases, 50 to 100, too many to count, what are options among that uh, menu of liver-directed therapies? Yeah, so I don't think ablation is on the table. Um, surgery is typically you know, not on the table either, especially when it's too many to count. Um, there are surgeons that will do um, a very aggressive resections, and I know some great ones as well, but typically when not when it's like 50 to 100. Um, so treatment-less menus, you know, embolization, PRRT, radio embolization, um, or even just octreotides to stabilizing. So, um, yeah, this is kind of the, the list of treatment that, that there are. Uh, at this time. Okay, so histotripsy, as exciting as it is, is off the table. Unfortunately, but... because it does fall in the category of ablation. Mm -hmm. okay. It's just uh, you have kind of see each individual lesion and target each individual one. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what about tumors outside the liver? I know we, we asked about tumors outside the liver before, but what about ones that are close to the diaphragm? Um, are any of the liver-directed therapies that can deal with tumors located close to the diaphragm? So I guess inside the liver and then outside the liver. Oh, yeah. Um, inside the liver, the liver-directed therapies is no problem. Now, if there are tumors near the diaphragm that are being supplied, by the diaphragmatic arteries, it limits your treatment options. So typically, we cannot do 190. Um, you go back to kind of blend embolization or chemoembolization because it's a little bit less toxic. But still, then patients will often have pain with like respiration. Um, ablation, if it's a small tumor, is a very reasonable option for those patients. Um, when you know tumors are outside the liver, you know um, there are you know described scenarios where are still case reports where you can do certain types of embolization. It's not typically done. Um, ablation is more often more common in those scenarios, but um, you kind of have to weigh the risk versus the benefit. Um, you know, it, is the tumor in this location actually going to impact your long-term outcome? Um, it's, or is it not? And is the disease in your liver really going to impact your long-term outcome? Uh, because you know, if the tumor in this location will not really impact your long-term outcome, then you know, aggressively treating it may come with more risk than benefit. Okay, really having to look at the whole picture and one tumor at a time. Really have to look at the whole picture. Yeah. Yeah. But what about um, 
uh, metastasis in the lymph nodes, would any of the invasive or non-invasive treatments be performed for lymph node metastasis? So lymph nodes, um, no, typically not specifically to uh, metastasis in the lymph nodes, unless it just kind of presents as a mass. Um, in kind of early stages, surgical resection of these lymph nodes are kind of encouraged. Um, if it's just kind of as a part of the surgery and, and diagnosis. Um, but I can't really speak to that. Uh, but we don't typically do ablations for uh, lymph nodes unless it's like a solitary one and there's nothing else anywhere else. Um, and speaking of ablation, and you mentioned pain um, before, what can we as patients do to get proper pain control immediately after, you know, any ablations? Um, this says hepatic artery ablations, but... Any ablation? Yeah, any type of embolizations, ablations, pain control is super important. Um, you know, I would definitely encourage you to speak with your doctor um, and talk about your concerns about pain control because every patient has a different tolerance for pain. Um, some people just kind of you know, have a little bit more pain and reaction to certain procedures and that is expected. And therefore, some people I would even keep in house for a day or so to make sure their pain is under control uh, before I discharge them. Uh, most patients tolerate fine with just some oral pain medications and um, some nausea medications that's needed. Um, I do some people home with a short course of pain medication. But yes, have this discussion with your doctor. This is something that's a very easy to manage and work out. And if we need to involve like pain doctors to help your pain under control, I'm sure this is something that your local doctor can do for you. Okay. Yeah. We want to make sure we have quali quality of life. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you mentioned the clinical trials and you mentioned retina a couple of times. And actually, if you could expound on that, but could you also touch on the recently announced clinical trials to improve the outcome of embolizations? Um, I think we're, I know that there's been, the retina trial just closed. Um, there's always new clinical trials looking at the effectiveness of different therapies. Um, and what we're looking for in these clinical trials are really to understand what therapy works better and for specifically, you know, which group of patients. And because there's still um, in current literature, a lot of heterogeneity in the patients um, in the different trials and uh, the heterogeneity in the treatments and even heterogeneous in the method of treatment. Um, and that makes interpretation of the data challenging. Uh, in addition to that, you know, retina is so remarkable because it's actually a prospective head-to-head -head comparison of, uh, and that is the most um, robust um, method of clinical trial um, because we have a lot of retrospective trials and a few prospective kind of case series, but um, uh, randomized control trials um, in terms of liver directed therapy and your endocrine tumors are still very limited in number. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I know we, we talked a lot about neuroendocrine tumors. What about high grades? So, can any of these treatments be used for someone with poorly differentiated? neuroendocrine carcinoma, um, particularly of unknown origin, but I guess any of them that's metastasized to the liver. Yeah, I think that is um, a very challenging scenario. It is something that will definitely and 100% be discussed at a multidisciplinary tumor board. Um, really with the input was kind of all specialties, including medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, and, um, you know, IRs and um, and even the, the nuclear medicine doctors who do PRT, um, because we, you know, typically that is not recommended. However, you know, in select cases, uh, exceptions can be made because of certain scenarios. So that is a, a real detailed uh, discussion is required. Thank you. Um, this is um, an interesting question. Are there radiation options like single beam for pancreatic nets? Yeah, um, this is a good question. I do not know the answer to that. So this is um, the doctors that offer these type of radiations are radiation oncologists. They are fantastic doctors and they provide radiation treatments without um, any incisions. It's kind of an ex exter uh, external beam radiation. Um, and, you know, I encourage you to find a center that has radiation oncologists and interventional radiologists and medical oncologists and surgeons that all work together to kind of 
discuss all those treatment options uh, for you to make sure nothing and like no stone is left unturned, basically, in terms of treatment options for you. Multidisciplinary tumor board, <laughs> as yes. always. Okay. Um, what can be done about cystic type liver lesions when they're too small to characterize and the AFP levels are slightly increased? Um, in liver cysts, if liver cysts are just liver cysts, that is not tumor, um, you know, most often we kind of leave them be. Now, however, if the cysts have characteristics that makes it suspicious, such as a nodule, et cetera, then, you know, I would kind of, uh, you know, often refer you to a surgeon to discuss treatment options. Um, AFP is challenging to interpret. Um, it's often elevated in hepatocellular carcinoma. However, AFP may be also be elevated in other types of tumors. Um, like germline tumors, as well as just like abnormal liver function. So um, AFP is a little bit broad. So I would highly encourage you to ask and uh, reach out to your GI doctor and, and a surgeon to see um, what to be done about that. Okay, thank you. Um, and this, this question, can liver metastasis be mistaken for FNH because of hypervascularity on MRI? Um, FNH tend to have a very characteristic appearance on MRI and imaging, um, but you know there are limitations to imaging. Um, not every tumor behaves the same way, so it can be. But it's um, you know you usually interpret everything in kind of a context together. So I think that's a very specific question. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. And what is FNH uh, stands for? Focal oh. nodular hyperplasia. There you go. It's like okay. a benign liver tumor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And how would someone go about uh, figuring this out with their doctors? Yeah. Um, so if your initial radiology report um, said it's the FNH and you want a second opinion, you can frequently take that report to another um, radiology group and they can do a second read or get a second interpretation, or it can be reviewed at a tumor board where a secondary interpretation is made uh, just to confirm, you know, what is tumor, what is metastasis. Okay. Thank you so much. Or if That's additional clear. imaging may be required. <laughs> yeah. So you can always get a second opinion or another uh, scan. Mm -hmm. okay. um, we talked about, you know, um, factors that impacted your decision, but how about the location of liver tumors? Like if it's more on the inside or the outside, how does it affect the procedure choice, like surgery type of ablation or embolization? It definitely um, makes a huge difference for surgery in terms of the tum location of the tumor, because the surgeons, they kind of have to, e if it's peripheral enough, it will be easier, it's, you can just kind of wedge it out. If it's deeper, they often do use ablation techniques. They can do ultrasound um, in the operating room with a different type of probe and do an ultrasound guided ablation um, intraoperatively as well. Um, if it's a tumor that is a lot more central near important veins, then they may have to do even like a potentially a hepatectomy. So it really depends on a variety of different factors. In terms of percutaneous ablation wise, we um, it depends a little bit on the type of ablation you'll be using. So thermal techniques such as uh, microwave or radio frequency ablation, when it's near um, like vessels, it can cause thrombosis of the vessels and it can cause injury to the biliary ducts. So in those scenarios, histotripsy and uh, nano knife are what will kind of shine because um, these two techniques will preserve the local collagen structures to kind of allow the blood vessels to stay patent and um, the biliary ducts to stay patent. Um, Embolization um, does have limitation in terms of tumor location as well. Predominantly, um, you know, what is the blood vessel supplying the tumor? Um, some tumor that can be a little bit challenging to reach are the ones uh, supplied by collateral supply, such as the intercostal arteries or the diaphragmatic arteries, or even sometimes tumors in you know, this first segment of the liver called the caudate can be a little bit challenging to select and embolize. Okay, thank you. That's that's very helpful. Um, and we talked about the location. What other factors determine if surgery or ablation are better? Oh, the most important factors to determine whether surgery and or ablation is better is um, the patient's kind of medical comorbidities, and um, in terms of 
how good a surgical candidate are they? Um, you know, are they otherwise relatively healthy or do they already have, you know, um, you know, a cardiac pacer and, you know, anesthesia will be very challenging and difficult uh, and the patient may not tolerate a full resection because uh, liver resection can come with um, a longer recovery time. So um, I would, you know, discuss, discuss kind of, uh, with your local surgeon and your interventional radiologist to talk about these treatment options. And ideally, one place that has the surgeons and the um, re interventional radiologists that work together to help determine which may be the best option. Um, typically, you know, I work with very good surgeons, so um, surgical resection remains kind of the gold standard in that scenario. So I have patients undergo surgical resections if they are surgical candidates, uh, but if they're not, then we'll offer them ablations. Thank you so much. Um, there's another question about uh, biliary stents and, and um, if someone has a, a bile duct block and stents, does it disqualify you for PRT? Uh, to my knowledge, it does not, but um, please talk to your nuclear medicine doctor to confirm that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so we'll just end with this last question. Um, you know, there's a lot going on and you mentioned the RETINET trial. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll learn more about that and, and feel free to go into more detail about that. But what advances do you most look forward to in this coming year? Oh, I am most looking forward to um, hearing more about the effectiveness of alpha PRT. Um, since they're using a different type of radiation that may be more effective, um, I think we hope to see more um, cytotoxic, which means like effects actually to kill the tumor rather than just keeping the tumor stable. Um, so I think that was a very uh, exciting new front that I'm looking forward to. So um, I think there's going to be a lot more therapeutics coming out. And um, in addition to that, we are doing a lot more genetic sequencing now for uh, cancers in general. So hopefully we can learn more about tumors and figure out what tumors can have specific targeted treatments based on specific tumor genetics. That's really interesting. So how do you think the alpha um, PRT will affect your role in the multidisciplinary team? Oh, I, and I hopefully it's more effective than what I can offer. <laughs> Yeah, I'm That's always, amazing. I'm, you know, I'm always hoping that there is even better treatment out there than what I can offer. That's, that's amazing. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you allowing us um, this time to pick your brain. I know we, we covered quite a bit of questions. I think it was more than 40 questions. And um, thank you for all the time that you've spent with us. Um, and I was just wondering also if you have any final words of hope to leave with the neuroendocrine cancer community as we close. Yeah, well, thank you for having me and thank you for joining this um, amazing kind of conversation here. Um, you know, we're always available um, as interventional radiologists, as doctors to answer any questions. So feel free to always reach out, even if it's just for an opinion, just for a visit, um, and just to talk about, you know, what we can offer for you. And um, yeah, well, um, best of holidays, good holidays, happy holidays. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate you and all you do on behalf of the neuroendocrine cancer community. And now I'm going to send it back to Heather in the studio. Thank you again, Dr. Cote, for that informational presentation and for answering those important questions from our audience. Educational programs like today's are made possible by our supporters, Ibsen, ITM Pharmaceuticals, Advanced Accelerator Applications, and Crenetics, and by donors like you. Please consider making a donation today at lacnets.org forward slash donate. And a special thank you to our technical director, Rich Tamayo from TVP Live for this high quality broadcast production. Follow us on social media to stay up to date on our upcoming events. Our handle is at lacnets. And now back over to Lisa. Thank you, Heather. Lacnets is a community of support and resources. We recognize that you are more than your disease and we aim to support you as a whole person. We offer many resources and programs. Find out more on our website, lacnets.org. Lacnets has a monthly podcast featuring experts who answer the top 10 questions in their field. Go to our Lacnets podcast page to check out the episode transcripts, resource, and the 10 questions we asked the expert. Thanks again for joining us. Goodbye. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. And we hope to see you next month.